Hello class, welcome to this lesson on 2-3. We're going to be talking um, a lot about correlation. So we want to address how do we estimate and interpret the linear relationship between two quantitative variables from a scatter plot. We also want to address the following question. How do we calculate the correlation between two quantitative variables? So our learning goals for the lesson include estimating and interpreting the correlation between two quantitative variables from a scatter plot distinguishing correlation from causation, calculating the correlation between two quantitative variables, and describing how outliers influence correlation. So the vocab from this unit, uh, from this lesson includes uh, the correlation as well as the correlation coefficient. So let's talk about correlation. In the previous lesson we used direction, form, and strength to describe the association between two quantitative variables and this was lesson 2-2. So we want to quantify the strength of a linear relationship between two quantitative variables. Uh, in order to do that, we need to calculate the correlation coefficient. So the correlation is a measure of the strength and direction of a linear relationship between two quantitative variables. Remember that when we were doing associations, uh, relationship between two quantitative variables in the previous lesson, we weren't necessarily doing linear relationships. We were doing you know, the form could be linear or it could be nonlinear. In this lesson, we're just focusing exclusively on the linear relationship. So the correlation R, which is which measures, you know, the strength and direction of a linear relationship, is a value between negative one and one. If it's negative, then that means that the association is negative, which means as one increases, the other variable in decreases. If the relationship is positive, then R is greater than zero, and that's showing that it's a positive association between the two variables, which means as one variable increases, the other one increases. If R is equal to one or R equals negative one, then there is a perfect linear relationship. That means all the points will be exactly on line. If there is very little scatter, then the R should be close to one or negative one. The more scattered, the closer the R is to zero. So basically from this, we know that the R value is between negative 1 and 1, including negative 1 and 1. And if it's 1 or negative 1, it's a perfect line. And if it's somewhere in between, it is not a perfect line. All right, so let's look at an example of a scatter plot uh, to determine, you know, what the correlation coefficient r is. So looking at this example, we kind of, we see that the scatter plot from the points are kind of scattered throughout. There doesn't seem to be any visible linear relationship here. So in this case, this is an example of a relationship in which the correlation coefficient r is 0. There is no linear relationship between the two variables. Looking at the next scatter plot, there does seem to be some kind of trend in the, you know, some kind of linear trend, some kind of downward trend. So some kind of trend going downward like that. However, the dots are very uh, scattered, even though they do clearly show a trend. So it turns out that the R is going to be negative because there's a negative association here between the two variables. Now, if you were to estimate the, you know, trend here with a line, and I'll do it in another color, let's say this were the linear trend, then you can kind of see that the points are very scattered. They're, they're very far away from that line on either side. So therefore, our R value is probably going to be close to zero. And in fact, it is. So if the R value for this, if you were to calculate it, is negative 0 0.3. So it's negative because there's a negative correlation, but it's very small. All right, looking at this other example, we clearly see that there is a positive association or a positive correlation. 
So if we were to draw like a trend line here, then it would look something like that. And the points are very scattered from it. However, you know, there, there are a lot of points that are actually clustered pretty close to uh, the line as well. So the linear trend on here seems to be stronger than in the other one. In fact, the R is equal to 0 0.5 here. All right, looking at this one, again, it seems to be even uh, more closely fitted to a linear trend. So the points are not as far away as they were in the other ones. They're more closely clustered, you know, the distance away from the line. So it turns out that this, well, we know that this is a negative association turns out that the R value for this is negative 0.7. So you can clearly see that the closer it's going to 1 or negative 1, uh, the closer it is to actually fitting into a perfect line. All right, e this one's even closer, even more. So if you look at that, they're very clustered together. So the R value here is 0 0.9. And then this one, it is very, very close to that uh, linear, to that line. In this case, the R is equal to z negative 0 0.99. Very close uh, to the linear trend, uh, but there's a little bit of uh, stray, but not very much. All right, let's look at the following example. So for the following relationship, is R greater than zero or less than zero? Is it closer to R equals zero or R equals plus or minus one? Explain your reasoning. So manatees are large, gentle, slow-moving creatures found along the coast of Florida. Many of these creatures are injured or killed by boats. A scatter plot below shows the relationship between the number of boats registered in Florida in thousands and the number of manatees killed by boats for years 1977 to 2013. So we have a scatter plot showing manatees killed versus the number of boats registered. And we want to determine, you know, the linear, the linear correlation coefficient if it's close to zero or close to positive or negative one. Well, in this case, if you look at the pattern, there clearly is some kind of trend going upward, right? So there is a positive correlation here. So the, we know that the R is greater than zero because of the positive association. All right. And now we know that since the, since the, uh, the points are very close to that line, that there, there, there's a strength in this association. So this is a strong association. Okay, so there is a strong association. In this case, in this case, we're talking about correlation, a strong correlation uh, between the two variables. Now, since there is a strong relationship between the two variables, the R is going to actually be very, uh, the R is close to positive one. All right, pause the video and try the following problem. All right, so here um, in this scenario, a statistics teacher randomly assigned students to seat locations in his classroom for a particular chapter and recorded the test score for each student at the end of the chapter. So the teacher wanted to see if seat location affects the test scores. The explanatory variable in this experiment is which row the student was assigned, where row one is closest to the front and row seven is farthest away. Here's a scatter plot showing the relationship between row and test score. All right, so 
if you look at the data, well, in this case, if you look at it, is R greater than zero or less than zero? Well, it seems to be a negative correlation. So it seems to be, it seems that the line, the, the general trend is downward. So there definitely is a negative association here. which means that R is less than zero. And however, it's a, it's a weak correlation, right? So, so this is a weak correlation, which means that the R value is close, closer to zero than it is to one. All right, and that just shows that there is no, there is a weak relationship between the seat location and the student's performance in the test. All right, so correlation close to one or negative one doesn't necessarily mean the, an association is linear. So take a look at the following example. We've actually used this example in a previous lesson. So the scatter plot compares the price in thousands of dollars to the weight in carats of a diamond. So if you look at this pattern, the pattern is that it follows a, an exponential trend, right? However, if you calculate the R value for this, it actually turns out that the R value is equal to 0 0.93. And that is if you were to connect these into like a linear line, like this, it turns out that the R value is actually very uh, very um, large, 0.93, which is very close to 1. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that, so this R value, and we'll actually change this to this, to the pink color, so we can kind of tell the difference. So that doesn't necessarily mean that it follows a linear trend. Clearly, from the scatter plot, it follows an exponential trend, not a linear trend, right? So this follows an exponential trend. whereas the correlation talks about linear trends. So correlation is not gonna help here when we're talking about the relationship between these two variables. So the only way that um, you can actually tell the form is by using a scatter plot. So this is why using a scatter, drawing a scatter plot is essential in order to determine the form of the relationship between the two variables. All right, so let's talk about correlation and causation. So correlation, like we men mentioned earlier, is a good way to measure the strength of a linear relationship between two quantitative variables. However, this doesn't mean that one variable caused the other. It only is saying that one variable is correlated with the other, that there is some kind of association between the two. But it doesn't say anything about who caused, which caused the other. So it doesn't say anything about causation. So it is highly possible for two variables to be correlated, but changes in one variable actually might not lead to changes in the other variable, which is why um, correlation does not imply causation. And this is actually very important in a lot of studies. In medical studies, they say that there is an association between these two variables, but and then they end up concluding that one variable caused the other, which is incorrect, which is false. The only way that you can determine whether one caused the other is to do an experiment and limit your variables, okay? So let's look at the following example. For the years 2000 to 2009, the correlation between total revenue generated by skiing facilities in the United States and the number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bedsheets is R equals 0 0.97. Does the strong correlation between these two variables suggest that an increase in skiing revenue causes more people to die by becoming tangled in their bedsheets. Explain. So it's kind of ludicrous to think that an increase in the revenue from skiing, you know, as that revenue increases, that actually causes a greater number of deaths, right? It's kind of ludicrous to, to come to that conclusion. Although there is a positive association between those two things, this does not mean that it caught one caused the other. 
So probably there is there uh, there is no uh, causation here. So what happened is probably that an increasing skiing revenue is pro uh, probably means that the population has grown and therefore there's more people skiing and therefore there's more people that just happened to be dying uh, from this cause of death. So the two variables are actually completely unrelated as far as cause. So what we're going to say here is although so so there is a strong positive association but an increase <clears throat> in skiing revenue uh, is unlikely to cause more Uh, deaths from tangling. Okay, so it is more likely that the population is increasing. which accounts for the increase in both variables. All right, so this kind of variable, the one that is hidden, is called a confounding variable. Okay, so in this case, if you're talking about population growth, uh, population size, right? This is the variable that's actually that could be impacting this study, right? That could be impacting um, this relationship that could be causing it. It's called a confounding variable. And that's because this variable is is the ver is the underlying variable that could potentially be the cause for this association, right? Uh, so sometimes we gotta untangle. Uh, the confounding variable, no pun intended, uh, we have to untangle it and determine, you know, what may be the true cause of this relationship. All right, so how do we go about calculating the correlation? So up to now, we've just been estimating the correlation, and I've been giving you the values. Uh, based off of whether it's a weak correlation or a strong correlation or somewhere in between. So now we're going to actually talk about calculating it. So here are the steps to calculate it. So you, first off, you need to find X bar and Y bar, as well as SX and SY. Okay. So S, remember, X is used for the explanatory variable and Y is used for the response variable. So we want to find the standard deviation and the mean, the sample mean. Remember, X bar stands for the sample mean. And in this case, Y bar also stands for the sample mean, but it's for the other variable, the response variable. Since now we're dealing with two quantitative variables rather than just a one variable like we were dealing with in chapter one. All right, so once we find these two values, we want to calculate the Z-score for both things. And so the z-score here is going to be zx when we calculate it for step one. For step two, when we calculate that, that will be zy. Okay, so once we find those, those you know, those uh, quantities, right, for each individual, you're going to multiply the z-scores together uh, between the explanatory and the response, the zx and the zy, and then add them up add up the products, then divide by n minus 1. 
So let's show you this formula <clears throat> for um, these to calculate the correlation coefficient. So to calculate the correlation coefficient, we have r equals. So now what we said is we're going to calculate the z-score So we're going to calculate the z-score for x and the z-score for y. And then divide that by, and then we're going to add those two z-scores to get the z-scores together. So we're going to do the z-scores for the x, the z-scores for the y. You're going to add them up for each, you know, set of values. Then you're going to divide by n minus 1. Okay, how do we go about calculating the z-score again? Well, remember that the z-score, the formula for the z-score, we'll write this off up to the side here. The formula for the z-score normally was x minus x bar over uh, standard deviation, right? So it was normally x minus mu over standard deviation, right? Like this. Uh, we used, you know, we used x minus mu over sigma, right? But in this case, we were using x bar and s. And, the, and, you know, in this case, it's not too worrisome that we're using mu or sigma. We're just, because we're looking at a sample, we're using these in place of uh, mu and sigma, okay? So this is the formula for the z-score. Uh, tuck that off to the side. So now, if we want to do it for zx, then this is going to be zx. And if we wanted to do it for zy, then this is going to be y minus y bar. And then this will be sx, and then we'll use sy for this guy okay that way we can differentiate between you know the standard deviation in the x direction versus the standard deviation for the y so now when we plug those into the formula we have the sum of x minus x bar over sx times y minus y bar over sy all over n minus 1 <clears throat> All right, so this is how we calculate the correlation coefficient. So we're going to be using the z definition of this um, So in order to calculate this. All right, so let's look at the following problem. The table shows the foot length in centimeters and the height in centimeters for a random sample of six high school seniors. Calculate the correlation for these data. So it looks like we want to figure out the relationship between foot length and height. Is it a positive relationship? Which I would suspect that it is uh, based off of the data uh, and based off of you know experience, right? So let's actually calculate this. So in order to calculate this, we need to actually be organized uh, with you know how we set this up. So let's say that x is the foot length and y is the height. Well in that case, I'm going to set up a table with my x and y. I'm going to rewrite the data so that I can set up a more organized table. Okay, so we got our x, y. So now remember, we're calculating the correlation uh, coefficient for this, right? So r equals sigma, the sum of the z-score in the x direction times the z-score in the y, all over n minus 1. So in order to calculate the z, remember, to calculate the z, x, you got to do x minus x bar over s, x, right? So we got to calculate the standard deviation in the x direction and then the, the x bar, the mean in the x direction. So the mean and then the same thing for the y, zy. All right, so if we plug it into the calculator, you can actually find the x bar uh, from the calculator. So let's write this out.
So using the calculations, uh, x bar is actually going to be 26. And the standard deviation, the sample standard deviation is 3.95, approximately. And y bar, the average for the y values, is going to be 168. The standard deviation, the sample standard deviation for the y values is 15.54. Okay, so now that we got those, we can actually make, do the calculation. So we're going to calculate the zx, which we know is x minus x bar over sx. And then the zy, which is y minus y bar over sy. And then we're going to multiply the two, zx times zy. <clears throat> okay. So I'm going to show you the first calculation uh, for zx and zy, and then I'm not going to show you afterwards. So for the first calculation, we have 23 minus 26 over so 23 comes from the x here, so we're using this x value, right? So we have, remember we're using x minus x bar, um, and, and x bar is 26, and then the standard deviation in the x direction we said was 3.95. And that is equal to negative 0.76, okay? So that's how you do the calculation. I'm going to show you uh, one more in each of them. and that will be 1.52. Okay, so that's how you do the Z. Now let's do the ZY, so you're gonna be doing the Y here minus the Y bar, which we know that Y bar is 168 over the standard deviation in the Y direction, which is 15.54. And that's about negative 0.06. And then the next one, I'll show you one more. So we're using the y value here. Minus 168 over 15.54, which is 1.29. All right, so now we're going to just go ahead and tell you what the values are for the next few. So the next one is negative 1.01, 0 0.51. 0.51 and negative 0.76 for the y's negative 1.16 negative 0.32 1.09 and negative 0.84 all right so now we're going to multiply the two values so we're going to multiply these two values together so we have, we're gonna, let's do it for the first two. So negative zero, let's do negative 0 0.76 and negative 0 0.06 first. So multiplying those two, we get 0 0.0456. And then we'll do one more where we show our work. All right, and then we'll just, just tell you what the next values are. All right, so now we got our product of Z scores. So now, according to the formula, we need to sum the, Z, uh, the product of the z-score. So we need to add these guys. So we're going to add, we're going to do the sum of the zx times the zy. So if we add those, if we add that column together, 
<clears throat> and then we're going to take that column and then divide by 6 minus 1. How do we know it's 6 minus 1? Well, n in this case, you know, is you have 6 values. So n is equal to 6. Okay, so let's go ahead and add these values together. All right, so we got 4.2091, and then we'll divide that by 6, oh, uh, actually, let's see it like this. So that's our guy, so that's what this guy is. And then now to calculate the R, we take the sum of the Z, the product of Zs, then divide by n minus 1. So we got 4.2091 over 6 minus 1. And if you calculate this, you get 0 0.84. Let me double check that. Yep, 0 0.84. So that's my correlation coefficient. So that means that that's a pretty high, uh, so if we were to interpret it, right, we know that there is a strong positive correlation between foot size and height. <clears throat> All right, so now uh, this is the let's look at the scatter plot of this association. So if we were to draw the scatter plot between height on the y-axis, so we said that height was the y-axis, and we said that foot length was the x-axis, right? Or the x values. So if we were to draw this, you know, essentially sort of like this line of best fit, right? Then the values are actually pretty close enough to that line where we have a correlation of 0 0.84, right? Now I want to show you in a different way how we can view this, right? So we actually calculated the x bar and the y bar earlier, right? So we calculated the X bar, so let's write this over here. We found the X bar to be equal to 26, and we found the Y bar to be equal to 168. So, how can we interpret this? So if we were to draw the X bar uh, being 26 as a vertical line uh, like this, let me draw this the best I can here. There you go. So there's our X bar, our X bar line. And then if we were to draw the Y bar line, 168, like this, so this is our Y bar line, then you can think of this, uh, these two means as separating this into four quadrants, right? So we have four little quadrants here. Now notice that, you know, and this is like quadrant one, quadrant two almost, right? This is sort of like our quadrant three, kind of like in the Cartesian plane, it splits it up into four quadrants. And notice that in these quadrants, um, you have everything on this quadrant and this quadrant. And that signifies that there is a positive correlation, right? That that because you have things in this quadrant and that quadrant, that uh, that's a that's a good indicator of a, a strong positive association. If you had a lot of numbers in say 
the second and the fourth quadrant, that's indicating that there is a strong negative association. And if you have values that are kind of spread out between the four quadrants, that actually tells you that there is zero correlation. So this gives you an idea of you know, what we're looking for when we're actually calculating the correlations and how we interpret those. All right, so now last, last thing, we're gonna talk about outliers. So how do outliers relate to correlation? So the scatter plot shows the relationship between cost in dollars and battery life in hours for a sample of netbooks. How do the two points in the lower right corner of the graph affect the correlation? Explain. <clears throat> All right. So first off, if we were to exclude the outliers, then this would most definitely be a positive correlation, right? So it looks like it's going in that direction. So it looks like it's a positive correlation or a positive association. However, the two points on the lower right corner um, are actually very influential because they make the correlation closer to zero or possibly even negative. So if we have this line of best fit looking like this with these two outliers, since these are so far away and extreme, it actually makes our line go more like this, right? Zero or possibly even be negative. Since they're so extreme, they're affecting our actual tr um, trend, right? In fact, I'm almost tempted to say that those two outliers actually make the line, make the trend almost look like this, where it's, you know, completely ne you know, negative. So outliers are definitely influential uh, for this reason. So in this case, we would say most of the points illustrate a positive correlation. Uh, the outliers, however, uh, strongly influence uh, the correlation coefficient. Um, making it closer to zero or negative. So uh, basically, this example kind of illustrated, right, that the formula for correlation, we know that it involves the mean and standard deviation because, you know, the correlation coefficient involves the z-score, right? So it involves the z-scores, but the z-scores themselves, right, actually have involved the mean and the standard deviation. So because it involves, you know, the mean and the standard deviation, and we know that these two are not resistant to outliers. So remember that the mean, which is x bar, and the standard deviation, in this case Sx, are not resistant to outliers. So the correlation coefficient is not resistant either because it involves those in the computation. All right, guys, that's it for the lesson. I hope you took something from this. Uh, the next lesson is going to be 2.4, which is regression lines and least squares regression. I'll see you in the next video.